let me first introduce Richard Blumenthal. Uh, in April 2004, Richard Blumenthal retired as Executive Vice President and General Counsel of SCT, a leading global provider of e-education solutions for colleges and universities when the company was sold. Richard had been with SCT for more than 18 years and had practiced law for almost 30 years. Richard told me he thought of the old adage, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. So he decided to apply to the MLA at Penn. He graduated May, or he's graduating May 2009 with a concentration in law and literature and is considering the um, Penn Master of Philosophy program for next year. He hopes to teach courses in law and literature at the high school or college level and will present tonight on the law and the novel in Germany and England from his capstone titled A Brief on Justice, which was read by Nancy Shawcross and Nancy Bentley. And I'm going to cue up his paper. Thanks, Chris. What is justice? Mm -hmm. There you go. The question at first glance seems easy. Justice is what is fair. Justice, however, is more of a moral concept than a legal one. And when the question is considered in the context of a complex legal system and social order, it's not so simple. In primitive times, law was the domain of the gods and gods were not to be questioned. As modern societies developed, it eventually became accepted that the law was a human product with all its human limitations and thus, and thus subject to question and criticism. Tensions inevitably arise between existing law and social morality and they produce legal crises. Debates over issues such as civil rights, women's rights, voting rights, gay rights, abortion, are but a few examples. In modern times, there is thus a growing sense that a critical attitude toward the propriety of certain laws ought to increase rather than decrease. Literature can be a powerful force in demonstrating the limitations of a legal system. Novelists especially have been drawn to law and justice for their material. According to, according to Ian Watt, Previous literary forms made conformity to traditional practice the major test of truth, and this literary traditionalism was first and most fully challenged by the novel, whose primary criterion was truth to individual experience. Similarly, Martha Nussbaum takes the view that the novel speaks to an implicit reader who shares with the character certain hopes, fears, and general human concerns and who for that reason is able to form bonds of identification and sympathy with them. In my view, the moral ambiguities and abuses inherent in any legal system are best understood on an individual level, offering novelists a profound antagonist to critique bad law. In support of my position, I will briefly review four novels that explore the concept of justice and expose the limitations of the law. Two are English. William Godwin's Things As They Are or The Adventures of Caleb Williams, and Wilkie Collins' The Woman in White, and two are German, Heinrich von Kleist's Michael Kohlhaas and Kafka's The Trial. <clears throat> the choice of English and German novels provides me with the opportunity as well to compare the differences between the two legal systems. The German legal system is codified. The English one is based on common law. Prior to 1215, the nature and conduct of proceedings in the two systems of criminal justice were virtually indistinguishable. In 1215, I'm sorry. In 1215, however, things changed dramatically in England when the Magna Carta was signed, guaranteeing the right to trial by one's peers. An equally significant event occurred two months later when the Pope prohibited clergy from officiating at trials by ordeal. As a result, governments were forced to adopt more rational methods of determining the innocent or guilt of the accused. The choice in England was radically different from that on the continent. The police minding thinking on the continent led to an inquisitorial system of justice dominated by the government. In England, they concentrated on the use of laymen in its system. Let's first look at the German narratives. 
The question of justice was fundamental to both Kleist and Kafka. Each studied law at the university, but Kleist never practiced. Michael Kohlhaas takes place in the 16th century during the time of Martin Luther and the Peasant Wars and centers on a dispute between a horse trader and aristocrats with influence at court. The trial centers on the imputed guilt of Joseph K., a bank clerk, and the bureaucratic inferno of the inaccessible legal system he encounters as a result of his arrest one fine morning. The situation becomes quite complicated in Kleist's story, but in the end, order is restored, calmness ensues, and most would argue a form of justice is achieved. On the other hand, the question of whether Joseph K. is guilty and what law he has violated has plagued exegetes of Kafka's novel from the outset. Wrong one, sorry. Michael Kohlhaas is a story more about the breakdown of legal procedures than the inadequacy of the law itself. The problems result from the failure of the representatives charged with enforcing the law to respect it. The protagonist's sense of morality leads him to break the law in order to restore it. When a too virtuous sense of justice can turn an otherwise law-abiding citizen into a robber and murderer of innocent people, something is terribly wrong. The conflict is triggered when Kohlhaas suffers a personal injustice at a crossing point on the border between Brandenburg and Saxony. Kohlhaas initially attempts to resolve the issue through normal legal channels, but he does not achieve justice in the courts of either jurisdiction because influential people in both capitals are related to the wrongdoer. Kohlhaas takes matters into his own hands and the action intensifies as his personal moral convictions drive him to terrorist-like activity. He creates a rogue army, which rapidly grows in number as it ravages and pillages towns and villages in search of the wrongdoer. Yet for the most part, Kohlhaas garners public support for his cause because he challenges the widespread corruption of the ruling class. Kohlhaas believes it is his duty to secure redress for the wrongs perpetrated and protect his fellow citizens against such wrongs in the future. If complacency reigns throughout the land, justice will not be served and corruption will remain unchecked. Kleist demonstrates that if a commoner cannot receive redress from the law, then the law is essentially a private power rather than a public law. Many readers assume that to Kafka, the law is nothing more than a metaphor for abstract theological, metaphysical, or psychological concerns. While there is no denying these aspects of his work, it would be short-sighted not to recognize that the frequent legal illusions in Kafka have jurisprudential significance in their own right. To be sure, the trial is about alienation, isolation, and guilt, but it is also about the social world and a corrupt legal system that exacerbates these feelings of inadequacy. At the turn of the century, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was ruled by the oldest criminal code in force on the continent, which was inconsistent with the needs of modernity. Unlike the objective German code, which defines a crime according to its, to its severity of punishment, the Austrian code defined a crime in subjective terms. Evil intent is a necessary element. So a criminal lawyer in Kafka's time would concentrate more on the alleged criminal mind than on the criminal act itself. The trial as a whole, one might say, is Kafkaesque. Joseph K. is arrested on the morning of his 30th birthday for committing an unspecified crime and is brutally executed with a knife one year later on the eve of his 31st birthday. The novel, in a sense, constitutes a burlesque of the legal procedures of the Austro-Hungarian code that Kafka studied. The absurdity is intensified by the clownish behavior of the various representatives of the legal system. The arresting officers eat K's, eat K's breakfast and steal his underwear. Court staff fall ill when they breathe fresh air but are perfectly healthy in the musty courtroom. The law books that the magistrates read are, in fact, pornography. Amidst an atmosphere of impending doom, the behavior of most of the characters in the novel is quite irrational. Kafka's close friend, Max Brod, says that laughter filled the room when the author read aloud the first chapter of his novel to a group of his friends. 
It is not surprising that Kafka liked slapstick films, especially Charlie Chaplin. Certainly, the novel goes beyond the obvious absurdities to substantive and metaphysical concerns. But what makes its impact so poignant is that the metaphysical aspect is rooted in the historicity of the world Kafka depicts. The foresight of the novel in assessing the implications of imputed guilt and torture on not only the individual but on society as a whole eerily presages fascism and the horrors of Nazi Germany. Kafka portrays the injustices of a subjective legal system, a system in which the inquisitorial preliminary investigation displaces all the other stages of the proceeding that would otherwise guarantee the individual rights of the suspect. As the astonishing first sentence tells us, Joseph K. is arrested one fine morning without having done anything wrong. He is not told what crime he has committed. Guilt is ascribed to him from the time of his arrest. He is moved through the system from inquiry to execution without notice, trial, or the opportunity to provide a defense. No matter how diligent his efforts, Kay cannot seem to obtain any knowledge of or meaningful personal contact with the law because it is administered in secret spaces, attics, bedrooms, apartments, even closets. The implication is clear that Joseph K. is executed like a dog because of who he is rather than for what he has done. Kafka shows us that if the law is inaccessible and detached from the principles of moral fairness, there can be no justice. Godwin and Collins also effectively used the novel as a vehicle to illuminate the way in which the law falls short of a truly public law. Caleb Williams explores class distinctions in late 18th century England and the ability of the upper class to tyrannize the lower class through both their social status and their access to an essentially private legal system. The woman in white centers on the willful manipulation of the laws affecting married women's property in 19th century England. In the woman in white, the law itself, namely the law of coverture, is the object of the attack while in Caleb Williams, much like Michael Kohlhaas, it is the breakdown of the legal process that results in the injustice. The 1790s was a period of political turmoil in Great Britain. The outbreak of the French Revolution in July 1789 stimulated intense political debate within Britain and polarized public opinion on the advisability of constitutional reform. It also fueled a growing radicalism. Concerned that what happened in France might be duplicated in England, the British government set out to undermine the radical threat. The government, believed that a revol the government believed that a revolutionary conspiracy was present and justified the use of judicial and legislative powers to combat it. Godwin was a prominent political philosopher and leading intellectual among English radicals. In Caleb Williams, he explores things as they are. The novel is built around the relationship between two men, Caleb, a commoner, and Fernando Falkland, a squire, each of whom is a stereotype of his respective social class. The hierarchical class distinctions between Falkland and Caleb remains carefully drawn throughout the novel, and the power that can be exercised by reason of class status is shown to be staggering. Instead of humbly keeping his distance and observing the obedience of rank, Caleb confronts his superior when he learns that Falkland has committed a murder. Caleb's failure to respect things as they are has consequences. The leading instrument that Falkland uses to control Caleb is ironically the law. Caleb's attempt to achieve personal equality with Falkland fails since Falkland can easily manipulate the legal system to punish Caleb's rebelliousness. Caleb is sent to prison for a crime he did not commit while Falkland, a murderer, remains free. Godwin makes clear that things cannot remain as they are when a man, simply because of his class status, will not be heard in his own defense. The benefits of being born into the upper class are awesome. As Caleb tells us, 6,000 a year shall protect a man from accusation, and the validity of an impeachment shall be superseded because the author is a servant. Caleb William portrays the injustice a person can suffer when the law is a private power rather than a public one. 
Collins also lived in an age of protest and reform, an age of increasing democracy in which the common people were becoming more visible and outspoken. Collins' interest in the law and legal reform is apparent from a letter he wrote to Edward Piggott, the owner of a liberal weekly paper for which Collins wrote. Legal abuse is a subject on which even your mild Protestant church and state man can feel and talk furiously. King Public would go with us with all his soul, quote us, praise us, learn us by heart on such a subject as law reform. The need for law reform provided a fiction writer like Collins, who was trained in the law but never practiced, with topical material around which to frame his story. In The Woman in White, Collins uses a legal fiction, the common law of coverture, to critique a system that can effectively erase a woman's identity. Under the law of coverture, a married woman had no separate legal identity. Unless protected by a marriage settlement, all her property belonged to her husband upon their marriage. A wife had no legal right to sue. If she separated from an abusive husband, she wasn't entitled to custody of her children. Absurdly, a husband and wife couldn't make gifts to each other because in effect, by the act of marriage, a woman gifted all her property to her husband and the fact that she could not legally hold property prevented her husband from gifting anything to her. Francis Power Cobb satirically addressed this ludicrous concept in a magazine article published in 1868. Cobb wittily imagined an alien coming to England and asking the question, pardon me, I must seem to you so stupid. Why is the property of the woman who commits murder and the property of the woman who commits matrimony dealt with alike by your law? Collins structures the novel as if the protagonist is gathering evidence for a trial. By doing so, he insists on its verifiable accuracy by utilizing nine different narrators who give their statements in the present tense. The structure has the effect of making the events narrated appear immediate and continuous, like actual testimony at a trial. The plot revolves around the willful manipulation of the laws affecting married women's property. Laura's husband and uncle conspire to obtain her fortune by falsifying her death and incarcerating her in an insane asylum, substituting Laura for her look-alike half-sister who has died of a heart condition after being given Laura's identity. They resort to identity theft to gain control of her property because Sir Percival's initial attempt at securing Laura's fortune by marrying her is thwarted by the terms of a marriage settlement. The marriage plot helps to focus attention on the issues surrounding the law of coverture and the vulnerability of women to the tyranny of their husbands. The centrality of Laura's identity loss after her marriage is a recurrent theme in the novel. As the reader is told, the wife of Percival Glyde might still exist for her sister, might still exist for me, but to all the world besides, she was dead. Dead to her uncle, dead to the servants of the house, dead to the persons in authority who had transmitted her fortune to her husband and her aunt, dead to my mother and my sister, socially, morally, legally dead. By his repeated use of the word dead, Collins emphasizes the devastating impact the law of coverture has on a married woman. Collins's letter to Piggott shows that he understood newspaper readers, and by implication novel readers, as individuals who could form bonds of sympathy for those who suffer from the abuses of the law, not unlike the model of the reader defined by Watt and Nussbaum. If the legal fiction of coverture elides a wife's being, then she almost literally disappears and cannot have any standing recognizable by public law. By tracking the mystery of a hidden wife, Collins is able to bring her into the public space of a novel and expose the injustice of the law. Law is a critically important aspect of modern life. It is the hallmark of civilization, a reflection of societal values. A legal system sets boundaries, regulates conduct, brings structure to a diverse group of people, and provides a framework for consistency and order. When the law is not just, however, it can be outright dehumanizing. The four novels I have examined are not simply about the workings of the law, but more compellingly, expose moments of crises when society discovers that the law has become problematic.
The novel is unique among literary genres in the amount of attention it accords both the individ individualization of its characters and the environment in which those characters exist. The novelist has the unique ability to create and develop characters with whom the reader can empathize and in this way enhance public awareness of morally ambiguous laws and abuses in need of reform. Caleb Williams and The Woman in White were extremely not popular novels in their time and were widely read by the literate public. It is not an exaggeration to claim that Godwin and Collins furthered the cause of the reform movement in 19th century England. The franchise was extended significantly, married women achieved the right to own property, and divorce laws were modified in favor of women. The literary imagination, however, has to contend with deep ingrained societal prejudices and will not always succeed in accomplishing reform. There is little or no evidence that Kleist's novel influenced change, and Kafka could not prevent the rise of National Socialism and the horrors of the Nazi regime. It is, however, in my view, essential to keep trying. If we stop cultivating the imagination through the medium of literature, Nussbaum says, we lose an essential bridge to social justice. As Kleiss, Kafka, Godwin, and Collins so insightfully demonstrate, storytelling can provide an, an essential ingredient in the understanding of justice and enhance public awareness of the need to reform an unjust legal system. Thank you.